All right, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. My name is Thomas. I do educational videos on this channel um, on many different subjects, but uh, for the last couple months we've been confined to working uh, with the reciprocal system of theory, which is a theory of everything um, that I think is highly uh, important, but very unknown. Uh, and so that's why I'm making so many videos of it. Uh, it's a theory of everything derived by Dewey B. Larson back in the 20th century, up until his death in 1990. And uh, it's great because it puts the power into your hands. If you can understand the reciprocal system and how it works, become fluent in it, then you can apply it to any subject that you want to. Um, and you no longer have to uh, bow down uh, and listen to the guys in the white lab coats and the guys with all the initials after their name that are telling you what you should think about these different subjects. You can figure it out for yourself. Uh, it's not easy, but it's uh, a lot easier than being wrong and listening to propaganda from, you know, billionaires and people with billion dollar budgets to uh, uh, obfuscate the truth or to, um, you know, put up some, uh, some smoke screen so that you can't figure out what's going on, which is uh, obviously uh, rampant right now. So uh, the basic idea behind Larson's theory is that the universe is not made out of matter. And the universe is not made out of energy. But the universe is made out of motion. Motion is the relationship between time and space. That relationship is a ratio, a fraction. Uh, and it shows that it, there is a reciprocal relationship between time and space, hence the reciprocal system. Time and space are the same, but they are reciprocals of each other in the same way that the reciprocal of one third is three over one, or the reciprocal of two thirds is three over two. So, you know, one is at the, at the numerator and one is the denominator. And then when you do the reciprocal, it's reversed. And the other one is the numerator, and the other one is the denominator. And uh, that reciprocal relationship uh, also uh, carries to the dimensionality. Both time and space are, uh, what we know about space is that it's three-dimensional, X, Y, Z coordinates. I would say three or four-dimensional, but let's just say three-dimensional. And... Uh, therefore, time is also three-dimensional. And um, what we know about time is that it's progressing. It's always getting later and later, the flow of time. Um, therefore, space is also progressing. Uh, it's, space is always getting farther and farther apart. And that has been seen by the Hubble telescope as the recession of the distant galaxies. They're always getting farther and farther apart. And the way that you, uh, and Larson refers to that as clock time or clock space. Um, and the the three-dimensionality he calls coordinate space and coordinate time. Now, the clock time is a scalar motion. A scalar motion is a kind of motion that has a magnitude, but it has no particular direction, or rather it has every direction. You can envision a scalar motion uh, on, in two dimensions, at least, on the surface of a balloon. If you take a balloon and you put a bunch of dots on it with a magic marker and then you blow up the balloon further, the dots are all moving away from each other, but in no particular direction. Um, the further, further away they are, the faster they're moving away from each other. And that is the same as 
the Hubble telescope, the precession of the distant galaxies. Those galaxies are moving away from each other, and the farther away they are, the faster they are moving away from each other. Um, okay, so uh, the other thing about the uh, reciprocal system is that both time and space are quantized, meaning that there is a minimum unit of time and a minimum unit of space. There's no half units or, you know, one third of a unit. There's only, you either have one unit or you don't have any. And then it goes by increments, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and one unit of space in one unit of time is the speed of light. The speed of light is not the maximum speed of, of the universe, as Einstein would have you believe, but the speed of light is the neutral point or the midpoint of the universe. Half of the universe is moving faster than the speed of light. Larson refers to this as the cosmic sector or sector two. And half the universe is moving slower than the speed of light. That's the half that we're familiar with and that Larson calls sector one or the material sector. The material sector grows by aggregation. Uh, atoms and molecules bond to one another and they glom on to each other um, until they get to their most comp complex uh, form, which is DNA. A DNA molecule has billions of atoms in it. And at that level, the DNA molecule becomes eligible to be taken over or controlled by a cosmic unit from sector two, faster than light. Uh, and so when the cosmic unit takes control of a material unit, kind of in the same way that a thermostat controls a room, it's just a small part of that room, but it controls the entire environment, then um, Larson, we have what is called the life unit. The life unit is a combination of a material unit and a cosmic unit that he calls control. And that life unit then develops or evolves uh, over time and up until its um, most complex form, which is the intelligent human being. And at that point, the intelligent human being becomes eligible to be controlled overall by what he calls a sector three entity. Now, sector three is the area that is outside of space and time or independent of space and time. Uh, I would submit that that would be somewhere in this light realm, in the boundary uh, between the material and cosmic sector. Now, we, do, we know uh, lots of things about the material sector from chemistry and physics and so on. Um, we don't know about this faster than light realm in sector two. Uh, but we can know it by extrapolation because what's going on in sector two is exactly the same as what's going on in sector one, except that the roles of time and space are inverted or in, uh, the inverse. And so um, we can extrapolate what's going on over here by knowing what's going on over here. So over here, we eventually will recognize that there are uh, just like there are atoms and molecules, over here there are cosmic atoms and cosmic molecules, uh, and so on. Now, uh, sector three, the region outside of time and space that uh, Larson refers to as sector three, uh, other traditions would refer to as God or gods or uh, the spirit world. They... Sector three communicates with uh, humans, intelligent humans, uh, in many different ways, uh, such as ESP, intuition, religious revelation, and scientific insight. Um, 
Now, those communications that we receive from Sector 3 are correct. Um, but our ability to translate that message is hindered by our limitations. And so sometimes we mistranslate those messages. And that's why sometimes they're wrong, or quite often they're wrong. But the information itself is correct. Now, uh, when we are controlled by Sector 3 and Sector 2, Sector 2 is governed by survival, life, the life unit, governed by survival, whereas Sector 3 is governed by ethical behavior or good behavior. And so um, sometimes those work in harmony, but sometimes they work separately and in conflict. When there are, there's a conflict, we use our free will to decide uh, which one we're going to follow. Now, we're here in looking at Larson's final book that's called Beyond Space and Time. came out after he died uh, in 1995, and uh, we're in chapter 19, about to finish this chapter, uh, called Good and Evil. And he's analyzing uh, good and evil, recognizing that you have to take all factors into account and weigh the balance, the net, between the harm and the good. And he's talking about an ethical code, which is many different communications from Sector 3 that we kind of all add up and turn into a, a tapestry, uh, a composite um, to come up with an ethical code. He says, a comprehensive knowledge of the provisions of the code and a careful examination of their application to all of the factors involved at any issue are just as important from the moral standpoint as the desire to do right. So we not only have to have the desire to do right, but we have to have the uh, proper understanding of the code. This view will no doubt meet with strong opposition, not only from those who contend that morality should be judged on the basis of intent, but also from those who realize that few individuals have a complete understanding of the code and who feel that it is unjust to require individuals to live up to the rules that are beyond their comprehension. But neither intent nor justice into the determination whether the code, uh, whether the moral code is being followed. I'll say that sentence again. But neither intent nor justice enters into the determination of whether the moral code is being followed. This is purely a question of fact and is independent of the intentions and the capabilities of the individual. Justice enters into the situation only in connection with the question as to whether a person should be held responsible for violations that he is not capable of recognizing as such. This is an important issue, but it has no relevance to the point with which we are now concerned. What needs to be emphasized now is that many of those who are capable of a better understanding of the code are not making the effort to acquire that understanding or to apply all of the moral knowledge that they already have. The wide, widespread tendency to have to base attitudes toward social, political, uh, and economic issues on emotion rather than on reason was noted in chapter 13 as, as definite a violation of the moral code as any of the acts that are commonly branded as evil, regardless of any opinions as to the relative seriousness of this, these violations. So, you know, basing attitudes on emotion rather than on reason is a definite violation of the moral code. The fact that religious leaders are among the most frequent and most flagrant violators of this aspect of the code makes the situation all the more serious as invoking divine authority in support of actions that are morally wrong when evaluated in their totality compounds the violations. No doubt most of the ecclesiastics are motivated by the best of intentions, but judgment as to the morality of their actions is not softened for that reason. As the old adage puts it, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. 
Nor is the conclusion as to the morality any different if the religious authorities and their lay followers have been led into violation of the moral code by strict adherence to the tenets of their religion. Full compliance with this code cannot be achieved unless the moral precepts of one's religion are given just as careful and critical scrutiny as if they originated elsewhere. Here, it may be asked, is strict compliance with the moral code so essential that we must give it precedence when it conflicts with our religious beliefs? This is a legitimate question and we will give it some consideration in the next chapter. Okay, so now uh, that is the end of chapter 19, and now chapter 20 he calls the moral objective. And presumably he's going to get into this question. Is strict compliance with the moral code so essential that we must give it precedence when it conflicts with our religious beliefs? Okay, so there is a moral code, which he calls an objective fact. And then there is our religious beliefs. Um, and at certain times, our religious beliefs may conflict with that ethical code. Okay, now we're going to just uh, get started here with uh, chapter 20 to get a feel for it. See where he's headed. The moral objective. The great majority of those who have rejected the ethical pronouncements of the organized religions and have endeavored to derive ethics from natural sources rather than from authoritative commands have concluded that ethical conduct is characterized by maximization of a sensation that some have called pleasure, others happiness, and still others satisfaction. Some difference of opinion has arisen as to whose happiness is to be the controlling factor. One school of thought, of which Jeremy Bentham has been the most influential exponent, argues that maximizing one's own pleasure or happiness is the proper goal. I believe that was called utilitarianism. This idea, this utilitarian idea, has considerable popular appeal especially among those who do not want to be bothered with moral issues at all. But it commands a little support among modern moralists for the rather, rather obvious reason that it is essentially a negation of morality rather than a basis for morality. Present-day philosophical thought follows mainly along the lines of the following definition by Bertrand Russell, who I think was a big-time Satanist. But uh, he will uh, give the quote here. I mean by right conduct, that conduct which will probably produce the greatest balance of satisfaction over dissatisfaction, or the smallest balance of dissatisfaction over satisfaction. And that in making this estimate, the question as to who enjoys the satisfaction or suffers the dissatisfaction is considered is to be considered irrelevant. It almost sounds like Aleister Crowley himself saying, "Do what thou wilt, you know, whatever floats your boat, you know, doesn't don't don't worry about how it affects any anybody else." The idea, okay, this is back to Larson. The idea that human beings should be happy and that happiness is therefore the basic moral objective has a strong appeal to those human beings since, as a rule, they want to, to be happy. Even the religious philosophers who are committed to the proposition that the moral code is an emanation from the deity rather than a reflection of human needs and desires usually contrive to bring the happiness concept into the picture indirectly. Uh, William Paley, for instance, tells us that happiness is an enjoyment which the deity has annexed to life. But when we examine the situation objectively in light of the factual imp information developed in the present investigation, we find no support for this position. Happiness, in its broadest sense, is clearly the inverse of suffering. Likewise, taken in a broad sense, 
and the two have the same significance in relation to existence in general. Okay, now when Larson is talking, when he ever, whenever he says the inverse, you know, that's a co code. Well, I don't know about code, but uh, for me, it's code uh, because inverse is the essence of reciprocity and that's the essence of his system inverse is how you you know when you you invert to get from time uh, space over time relationships to time over space relationships uh, and likewise when you invert something it maintains the same quality just like three halves is the inverse is two-thirds they both have the same qualities they both have three and two but it's that the uh, order is inverted. And so uh, when Larson uses the term, it has a particular meaning that is probably more important than if somebody else were to use it, because this is like the essence of his eff essence of his reciprocal system. OK, so happiness is clearly the inverse of suffering. As we have seen. Suffering is not wrong or evil. It is simply one of the routine accompaniments of life in a space-time universe. Similarly, and for the same reasons, happiness is not right or good, morally speaking. It, it, it too is just one of the routine accompaniments of life in a space-time universe. Happiness is desirable and unhappiness is undesirable, but in themselves both are morally neutral. They are part of our inheritance as aggregates of material substances and as products of biological evolu evolution. Okay, we'll end it there. We'll get back to chapter 20 when we start tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.